So now kind of switching over to what everyone is probably going to be focused on is this, uh, the presidential race. So again, in May, and these numbers change daily, if not weekly, much less monthly, um, Virginia is 51% Biden, 39% Trump, and then about 3% undecided. So I think they forced everybody into a choice here. Um, and it's important to remember that Clinton did not reach 50% in the state um, in 2016. So this is definitely a shift to the left in Virginia. Um, where does Virginia kind of land among other typical swing states or atypical swing states? Um, definitely more it, let, me, let, me, let me back you up on that. I'm just gonna challenge because Roanoke College hasn't necessarily had the most accurate polling in the, in the, in the world. But, but I think obviously Biden has a lead in Virginia. I'm not gonna dispute that whether it's 12 or eight, anyone's guess. So do you think the move has been to the left or away from Trump? I mean, that's been the, the trend here in Virginia is just you know, anything but Trump. Um, you know, yeah, but, but, but you're, again, talking to, you're talking a relative scale here to the other states, so. Talking relative scale to the other states, but I think it's hard to really tell because this is the Roanoke College poll and it's really the only poll that we've had since May. I don't have enough data to really tell you if it's if it's Trump specific or if it's to the left. I mean, we can look back. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and I have talked after the, the 2019 right. election yeah. that it, the state did move to the left and whether how much of that was the president um, and Democrats ability to tie local candidates to the National Party, uh, how much of that was the effect or was it some more specific state concerns um, like gun control played a played a big but part it, in the 2019 elections. Right. So it, it's but what we are what we are seeing though obviously is this sh the shift that's occurring in this country is fascinating to watch just on this list alone you look where Virginia is relative to Colorado and Michigan we would never have thought ourselves ten years ago to be between Michigan and Colorado politically I think we're also close to Oregon um, but you also look at here where Georgia and Texas are where Missouri is which used to be a pretty much of a swing state where Ohio is back to being you know. Uh, swing state, uh, Pennsylvania swing state, uh, Florida, you know, um, these, these are, we're, and Minnesota is probably one of the surprise states here too. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Minnesota has trended a little bit more Republican, especially in the Trump era. Um, but it's a little, it, it's surprising that Virginia is more blue than Minnesota. Um, and if you kind but of look that's, at it, but that's, but that's the cultural shift that's occurring in this country, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're talking about, uh, very different states now, whereas the old DFL in Minnesota used to used to rule the roost. Um, you saw the you saw the results in in 2016 that eastern part of Minnesota and the what do they call it the Iron Belt up there uh, mm -hmm. shifting towards toward the blue collar Minnesota voter, the Democratic voter now shifting a little bit possibly to uh, and. Uh, to Trump, and I don't know if this, the Minneapolis police situation with the police union and the problems they're going to have, they're going to possibly move Minnesota closer to the Trump column. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it has been interesting to watch kind of the blue collar move towards Trump and Republicans more yeah. generally, and then the college educated move more towards the left. Now, whether that is a short term Trump effect or if that's going to be a more long term realignment of the parties, we'll have to see, you know, in a right. couple of right. years, whether it's you know, two or four or, or six or however long. Okay. But that's a, but that's a great chart there. That's the one that I sort of locked on when you sent it over to me earlier. It's like, where's Virginia now relative to, you know, you know, we're not, it's, those aren't regional states that we're around politically, right? We're, yeah. we're not talking North Carolina, Maryland, or Georgia or South Carolina, Tennessee, you know, that's just not who we are anymore. And it's, you know, it's interesting. So Virginia is you know, D plus 12. Kansas is R plus 12. So if you look, think about, you know, who is kind of our Republican counterpart to Virginia, it would be Kansas, which I think you would think is much more Republican than, than it is. And I think it's just pushed, the politics lately has been pushing more states into this middle ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Look at Utah, though. And I, and I saw that Utah poll because you know, Clinton only got like 27% there and in 16. Um, the, they had the a strong one -on -one, third party support there. What's that? They had strong third party support there. Um, in they, they, well, that was the Evan McMullen race. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wrote about that last week. Um, but Utah, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a toss up, I mean, I think Utah is going to break hard for Trump in the end. But 
you know, Utah in play is, is it just shows you the changing uh, nature of states these days, how dynamic things really are. Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, so it's important to put all this in context, right? Where was, where is Trump now compared to where he was in 2016? So right. as of June 9th, 2016, Hillary was up by four, um, an average of, of 3.2 to 3.8. So this is as both candidates were trying to consolidate their base um, after tough or during tough primary processes for, for Clinton. Um, whereas on the right, you know, Biden's leading now by eight. And again, this is nationwide. So it, I, I hate really looking at nationwide states when we're talking about an electoral college play. That's you know one of the mistakes that the Democrats often make. Still, um, though, I don't. Well, still, though, let's let's you know he he, he has you know fallen from forty three six at the end of the day, um, you know last time to forty one seven. I think he ended up at forty six nationally. Uh, and then, you know, Clinton got up to 48, I think. And there's no, and then the third party guys aren't as prominent this year. And Evan McMullen and Jill Stein and, um, and those folks. So the fact that Clinton was only ahead by four, I think showed that that was more, I think people were still laughing Trump off in 2016 at this point because they're like, it's Donald Trump, he's never going to win, right? Now it's an eight point gap, but let's be honest, I think Joe Biden is a weaker national candidate than Hillary Clinton for a number of reasons, but he doesn't, doesn't draw the animosity that Hillary Clinton did. I think that's a- People that's aren't a opposed point. to, people, people aren't opposed to Joe Biden as much as they are Hillary Clinton, but they're also not that excited about him either. I agree. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the anti-Trump uh, momentum is, kind of overcomes the lack of excitement for Joe Biden himself. Um, you know, looking at these two charts, I, think I, I never want to try to predict Trump support long term. Um, I think there's too many surprises. I think he can rebound better than I've seen any, rebound to a point where he's competitive and better than I've seen pretty much any politician do in a, in a very long oh, time. Oh, absolutely. I think if, if we start seeing a, a, a steep upward trend on employment, if we see the economy and jobs coming back, and we see a move towards law and order, and we see a move towards China, I think he's, he's going to have to strike out and, uh, and campaign. I mean, you know, you, you pollsters and modelers do what they do, and they're going to say, here's what you want to talk about, and here's how you want to talk about it, and here's who you want to talk about it to, and where they are, and you know, that's how numbers move. And you get a couple bad gas from Joe Biden, this thing's back in the margin of error, but right now it's outside the margin of error. It is. Um, and also, if you look back at kind of the, the left-hand side of the Clinton-Trump um, graph here, there are touch points. You know, there are points when the race was, was even, um, whereas you don't really see that so far in the Trump versus Biden chart. That uh, again, spike, that spike in the, uh, the 2016, what was that? Do you remember what that was? We need to take a little dive on that. That looks like at the end of July, September. Um, I would bet that that's when they first announced a um, an investigation into her emails. Mm. I, th I think okay. he came out in the summer and said that, that okay. they were investigating. And yeah. it's also at a point when he Trump started to be able to consolidate Republican support. Yeah, and that was also convention time. So, okay. All right. Great. Four, um, to, four, so four to eight. <laughs> <laughs> So just, you know, to your point about, about Biden, I think there's a lot there. I think they're, you know, the left really pounded away at a lot of issues in the primary about why he was um, not the best standard bearer for a party that has moved further to the left. And I, I think there's a lot of opposition research. I, you know, we've talked, I, I'm a former opposition researcher, reformed opposition researcher, I guess. Um, and, you know, there's a lot there. And there's, you know, over the course of a 30, 40 year public career, you're going to have cases where you voted one way in the 80s, another way in the 90s, and then flipped right. back. You know, there's going to be a lot of flip-flops that, that well, Apple can point to. Well, let's talk about opposition research, because I think this is a, a, a critical part of the conversation that you and I are having, because you see, you see Biden almost at 50, which is a danger, which is a danger for any, any uh, challenger to see your opponent at 50. I mean, that's like, and that you're, you're pretty much, you're almost done at that point, in my estimation. Once you cross that 50 threshold, 
it's 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 very harmful for your chances. And, and I don't care where it is in the cycle. When you're at 50, especially when you get when you're in, you're coming into July, that, that's like oh, like, yeah, this is a problem when when you, especially when you're in the incumbent. But opposition research is only as good as the narrative that you have set up against your opponent. So it has to feed this narrative and it has to, whatever the Trump team comes up with in opposition research, and I agree with you, I'm seeing more and more of it on social media. They're going to come at him with like, he's not that good of a guy. Mm-hmm. He's not, he's, he's bad on racial issues. Um, he has a number of gaps in this area, a number of bad votes. And that's counter narrative to the narrative that the Biden people want to put out there. And that, that drives the whole turnout model. What are you seeing or have you been in this realm at all on Biden when you're polling and modeling? So I think just to kind of talk about what the narrative should be, you can run multiple narratives, especially in a, nat- a national race like this. Um, what we did a lot of, and I was with America Rising, the opposition research firm here in DC, um, against Clinton was actually in the early part, we would run, she's not liberal enough stories. Uh, we would push them out on our social media. We would try to get some stories placed uh, in you know, the Huffington Posts of the world and say she's not liberal enough to try to decrease some momentum for her among her own base. Right. Um, so that part will be there for Biden, especially as Black Lives Matter is you know, more, of a, more of a push. And you know, it, it was already kind of creeping up in the conversation during the primary, you know, his support for the crime bill in the 90s. Um, being able well, to kind of it, well, that was his bill, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. And, and then, that was that was the Biden crime bill. I mean, that's yep. the way they're going to put it, right? They're going to and they're going to put those social media posts and those um, stories and those ads on local radio. It was Joe Biden's bill that put people in jail. Yep. And Anita Hill, and and that's going to undercut him with some of the Democratic women. Anita Hill. Yep. Well, so Anita, all of that stuff Anita is going to come back. Well, you know, him just kind of shutting shutting that down and helping get Thomas on the court, that's going to be an issue among Democratic women. Um, again, you saw it a little bit in the primary, and it's another way to kind of get at him from the left. Uh, okay. Now, from the right, we'll see if he's pull- how far left he is pulled by this law and order perspective. Uh, you know, some of the We'll see if Obamacare comes back, if healthcare is, is as big of an issue in 2020 in the fall as it was in Virginia last year or in 2018. It was a major issue, especially among independent right. voters. So kind of his legacy points, we'll be able to see if the, the opposition research resonates. And that's really where, where polling comes in. We can see how these messages resonate with certain people. And the modeling, what the modeling allows you to do is kind of build on the polling and say, okay, Polling said that uh, the Obamacare hits only work with, you know, 10% of people, let's say. Right. So that's, you wouldn't necessarily say, okay, that's what we should go up on all broadcast with. We should hit everyone with that message. But when you right. add in the modeling element, we can find who exactly those 10% of people are. And then you can target them with digital, you can target them with mail, phone calls, um, anything that you really do on an individual basis, as far as voter contact methods, you can actually touch those people with the healthcare message that they want to hear that is going to move their votes. Um, it, it's really yeah. allowing elections to be a little bit more personalized and really talk well, to voters about that. I, and I, I, think it's, I think it's becoming far more a la carte. Because mm-hmm. uh, we're in this horrible binary choice realm of you get A or B, but you don't choose really A or B. You choose subset of A and subset of B and say, look, I'm going to vote for judges or I'm going to vote against Benghazi or I'm going to vote for this. I'm going to vote on China. I'm going to vote for Black Lives Matter. Whatever it is, the voter's not going, I'm voting for Joe Biden. I'm voting for Donald Trump. They say, I'm voting for this about them. I'll take that because we have a, I mean, let's be honest, we have a very good lifestyle here in America. We've got it pretty good. We can justify to ourselves that we're going to vote a particular way for a particular reason and explain it to people. Like, and mm-hmm. give you an example. Over the weekend, um, um, I was with a group of friends and we were talking about politics, which I never like to do because it's just, you know, don't bring work home. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, and this one Democrat, solid Democrat voter who grew up with in a very patriotic household in Western Pennsylvania, teacher, re- recently retired teacher. I and mean, this, is, this is like the female core, what I would consider a core Democratic voter. 
said she voted for Donald Trump. And I was surprised. And I said, really, why did you do that? And she said, because of Benghazi. And that stunned me that she voted for that one thing for mm -hmm. Donald Trump, who she didn't even like because she hated Hillary Clinton. So she justified by saying, look, I voted, I voted against her because of Benghazi. So it was that negative partisanship, but on an issue. And that's, and that's what polling and modeling finds are those slivers of those activating points. Yeah. And that's, that's always fascinating to me about politics is finding out what really motivates people to do things because what you see on TV is a part of that, but you never know. I don't know what motivates someone to do something, but when you talk to me, you're like, wow, it was about judges. It was about Benghazi. It was about, you know, taxes. It can be about a specific issue, but that's what it is. And it could even be about a local issue. I mean, especially when you're talking about, you know, looking ahead to next year in, in Virginia, it's it's going to be a lot of very small local issues and maybe so-and-so didn't fill a pothole fast enough. Um, if, you know, they're running for, for assembly or something like that. It, it, it's People make up their minds on very minute things and, and it's not always the obvious thing. And that's, and I think, is that, I think that, especially the Republican Party here in Virginia, they've lost all sign of that. Their messaging is so, I will talk about that another time, but their messaging is so bad on so many issues. People go, why are you worried about this? Because you're